Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to week three of our fall series, uh, which are, we are calling Discipline Equals Freedom. And I've taken the name of this series from a book by the same name uh, by this guy, real-life superhero Jocko Willink, who is a former Navy SEAL, jiu-jitsu guy right now, uh, specializes in sort of motivational speaking and leadership development. And, and one of his key emphases in his life's work is to advocate for discipline in the, self, in the sense of a self-discipline and reminding us that this is really the path forward in terms of all sorts of uh, ways of success in life. So this is week three of this. So we took the first two weeks and I kind of did a general introduction to this series. And so today is the first day we're going to focus in on one particular discipline. Because the angle we are looking at this fall is what the Christian tradition has called spiritual disciplines. And these are spiritual practices or spiritual habits, activities, deliberate things we can build into our lives that the Bible or the Christian tradition has said, if you do these things, this will help you to grow spiritually. So these are not things that automatically transform us, automatically bring us closer to God, but these spiritual disciplines or habits are, are ways of placing ourselves where God's Spirit will best bring forth transformation in us. And so we're going to look at the first specific discipline this week that we're going to focus on. And this first week, it's going to be the, the habit or the practice of solitude. Solitude, meaning being alone. And so I, I was thinking this week about uh, this guy who I'm kind of drawing upon for a theme, and, I, and I, wondered, uh, I wondered if I could find this sort of theme in his life experience. And so I was interested to see, uh, look on the screen here, here's a bunch of tweets I just looked at. I took, his last month of tweets, I just took some screenshots here. And what he will often do in the morning, because he advocates everybody to live with discipline and work out hard every day, so when he gets up in the morning, he'll take a picture of his wristwatch and tweet it out saying, all right, I'm up and moving. Doing his morning workout. What times we got here? 4.14, 4.30, 4.16, 4 4.28. So if you wake up at 4.30 in the morning to hit the gym and to lift weights, odds are how many other people are going to be in their gym with you? Probably nobody, right? People like me are going to be in bed. So this tells me Mr. Jocko spends a lot of time in solitude. And that doesn't surprise me either when I found uh, this tweet going back a few years. Look at this one. He said a few years ago, Alone plenty, fine with it, prefer it often. And that did not surprise me one bit. Because if you look at a guy like this who's been so successful in so many areas of life, my suspicion is if you find such a person, they probably have their life fairly well crafted when alone. They probably have learned to leverage solitude to shape them into what they want to be. Especially if you find someone who's successful in life that has maintained kind of uh, uh, an ethical life and has not turned into a train wreck, train wreck where they f blow all their relations. Like, we could be super successful in certain ways in life, but maybe our personal life's a wreck. Well, if we see someone who's very successful in life and their personal life has been maintained, my guess is this is probably someone that has figured out how to leverage solitude well. Because the reality is, in terms of life and success in, in every area, especially as we look at it as Christians, who we are when we're alone is probably way more important and indicative of who we are than when other people are watching. So yeah, Jocko's taking a picture of his wristwatch every morning, but essentially he is there by himself, waking up every morning, lifting weights by himself, pushing himself down the path that he has chosen for himself. So we want to try to leverage some kind of this intensity, some kind of this uh, self-discipline, and apply this to our lives as Christians. So in your bulletin, if you got one, you will find a small book I have prepared for you again. If you did not get a bulletin this morning and you're here, I'd recommend you grab one from the back. Those of you online, hello, by the way, uh, you can download a PDF of this somewhere there around where you're watching the video. And we're not going to go over all of this. I've given at least half of this to you for you to look at, to read over and reflect over on your own, and then hopefully discuss with some other people as well. But as we consider this key discipline or practice this morning of solitude, let's walk through 
the notes here. So look at number one, and we'll start as we're going to do every week of this series, which with, with reminding ourselves of our, a call to discipline. So the call to discipline and self-control, this is not something that just uh, this guy, Jocko, is advocating. I want us to see that this is something that God is calling us to, to engage more in terms of discipline and self-control. So today, let's do this by uh, looking at this Proverbs, th- this, this verse from the book of Proverbs. Look at it on the screen. This is Proverbs 25, 28. And I would like all of us to read this out loud together off the screen. Okay, here we go. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. All right, so a lot of our younger kids went off to children's church, but any students or kids that are here, have you ever seen a city with a wall around it? Josiah's seen one. Where, I wonder? Okay, you've seen pictures. So at least maybe you've seen pictures, or maybe some of you have been to Europe and seen actual remains of ancient cities with walls built around it. Now, this was very common in the ancient world, so common in the ancient world, it shows up in a proverb here. Why would you build a wall around your city in the ancient world? Ooh, I heard some excellent mumblings. Yeah. To keep people out. Threats. Dangerous people. Okay, so imagine if we were living in older times here in Grand Rapids, and we were living under constant threat of attack from the neighboring city-states of Coleraine, and Cohasset, we might in fact build a wall around around Grand Rapids. So if the unwashed barbarians from the neighboring towns come attacking Grand Rapids, all the little villages and, and huts can empty and we would all gather inside the city. And so if you are an attacking army and you're attacking the city and they've got a wall around it and everybody's fled inside, they're up on the walls with like bows and arrows and boiling oil and rocks, What's the big thing you have to get through first and foremost if you're going to deal with this city? you got to take out that wall. So there's a whole technology in the ancient world of trying to get through the walls of cities. You can try to shoot stuff at the walls to knock it down. You can make little roofs and, and like have a battering ram to try to take down a gate, which is going to be the weakest point. You can try to dig under it. So what happens to a city if its walls get broken through in a siege, particularly in the ancient world? By the time they fight their way through a wall, is the attacking army happy and like you, or are they unhappy and don't like you? They're tired of being shot at and having burning oil burned on them. So in the ancient wall, if they break through the walls of your city, what happens to you? You either die, or you get sold as a slave. That's it. So notice this is not a little academic metaphor that the author of Proverbs is drawing upon. He's tapping in a primal fear of ancient life where they knew very well what would happen if a city wall gets broken through. And your life is over. You're ruined. You're shot. And so notice the the wisdom teacher here has taken this image and said, look, if you live without self-control, without the ability to control yourself, to choose your reactions and to choose your actions, if you don't have self-control, you're like a city whose wall has just been punctured, wide open, exposed, and you're about to get cooked. And so this is a call for us to practice self-control. And this is really what Jocko means when he talks about discipline. And so this is not just good advice, But this is actually a truth of what God has said to us in the scriptures. This is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. One of the things the Holy Spirit wants to bring out in us. Because self-control will protect us from all sorts of problems. Relationally, health-wise, socially, uh, financially, and most important of all, spiritually. Okay, so let's move on to part two then and remind ourselves What is the model of the spiritual life we're working with this fall? A lot of different ways we could think about this, but look at this image on the screen. I decided not to print it on your outline this week. So here's our our model for how to think about our lives as followers of Jesus. Notice in the center our hearts. Here's the most important, who you are on the inside. What do you love the most? What do you long for the most? Do you love God? Do you desire him above all else in your heart? Okay, there's the key. Notice we have this horizontal line pushing us this way with an arrow. We have a direction. If you're a follower in Jesus, you are supposed to do certain things. You're supposed to represent Jesus. You're supposed to show his sort of lifestyle to others. You're to carry the message of the kingdom. There's things we're supposed to do as followers of Jesus. 
And in Christian thinking, this flows out of being who we are over here. In other words, you become a believer in Jesus. Spiritually, you are united with him. You are buried with him in baptism. It's like you have died with him like we saw today. Come out of the water, Paul writes, it's like being raised back to life. This is a picture of the spiritual death and life we experience when we become one with Jesus. So now what defines you is not all the normal things about you, but primarily now you have died and raised with Jesus. You are now one with Jesus. This is who you are. And so your Christian life becomes about trying to live that out in practice. Well, how do we do that? Well, notice the circle. Here's the mechanism we're going to suggest of how this works. Notice at the bottom, desires. What do you want? What do you want the most? Do you want God the most? Do you desire his kingdom the most? Or do you love mini golf the most? Or whatever. Insert your stuff. So notice if you have these desires to live for God and to seek him, this is going to lead to certain practices, habits, and activities. And what are these habits and and activities going to do? Well, notice it's going to increase your desire for God. So here's a reinforcing cycle. And in this fall, we're focusing up here on top at these practices or habits. What are the things we can actually do that will get this circle rolling for us? What can we do that will place us in the position where God's spirit will bring forth the growth and transformation that we want? So that's where we're headed. And so we're going to be looking and zooming in on various specific practices or disciplines this fall. And with a kind of experimental attitude, we will try to practice them during the week. And some of these things, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you've done this a lot. Uh, Some of you, if you've been a Christian a long time, some of these will be new to you. And so we're going to try to take an attitude of experimentation with these, try these together, and we will observe and see what sort of uh, positive fruit it has in our lives. And everybody's a little different, so some things will connect uh, with some people more than others. Okay, I think that's all I want to say about that. Look at part three. We're going to zero in on this discipline of solitude. With kids, solitude, fancy word, means being alone. Yes, Yes, being alone. So, we're not going to read all of this. Look at the first little paragraph there under point three, just the first two lines. Solitude is the spiritual discipline of voluntarily and temporarily withdrawing to privacy for spiritual purposes. Okay, so this could be a short time. It could be a long time. But the essential idea is we're going to draw away from other people into privacy. And this is not just to, just to um, you know, relax. It's not to read a book or to do other, some, some hobby. Those can all be valuable. They can even be valuable spiritually. But this is a particular focusing type of solitude. It's for spiritual reasons, to intentionally separate ourselves from other people in privacy, so it's just us and God, for the purpose of trying to grow spiritually. Skip that next one, drop down to the third one. Look at this description. Solitude is a container discipline for the practice of other spiritual disciplines. Okay, so it's true practicing solitude like this, getting away from other people and focusing our mind on who we are, with everything else stripped away before God. This has some great merit all on its own. But solitude as well is so important because as she calls it here, this is a container discipline for a bunch of these other practices. So it's true, some spiritual disciplines are communal that need other people. So you come together to worship with other people. If you're going to confess your sins to someone, you need another person. A fellowship is people together. Uh, um, A prayer group is a group of other people. But plenty of the spiritual disciplines must be practiced alone because it is essentially between you and God. And so this is going to necessitate solitude. So on one hand, this is a very foundational practice for us because it's going to lay a base for a bunch of the other disciplines we will engage in. So look at the last quote under point point three. This guy writes, Of all the disciplines of abstinence, Solitude is generally the most fundamental in the beginning of the spiritual life, and it must be returned to again and again as that life develops. That guy will split up all spiritual disciplines into two categories, of abstinence and engagement. A discipline of abstinence is us pulling away from some normal thing, which may be good, but for the purposes of spiritual growth, we pull away. Uh, There's also what he calls uh, uh, disciplines of engagement. So these are things we do. So fasting would be a 
uh, a discipline of abstinence. We give up food for a time for spiritual reasons. The opposite discipline, discipline of engagement is celebration or feasting, deliberately going in to eat with spiritual purposes. And so he suggests that of all the ones of abstinence, and other people will say of all spiritual disciplines, a solitude is the most foundational or one of the most foundational, which is why I decided to start with it. So let's see what we can see about this in the scriptures. Uh, unsurprisingly, we'll see this in the lives of people in the Bible. And in fact, in the life of the most important person in the Bible. So look at, look at part four here. Uh, notice, Jesus in solitude. Look at a bunch of passages I gave you where we see Jesus practicing uh, this habit of solitude, of being alone. We won't look at that first one in Mark 1. We've already talked about that. That is Jesus' time alone in the wilderness. He goes off by himself for 40 days. Uh, drop down to the next one. Look on the screen at Mark 1.35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus had a Twitter feed. He could take a picture of his wristwatch, put it up there, back on the path. Right, so notice, Jesus gets up super early. He didn't have to do that. Bed's nicer. It always hurts to get up early. Notice he gets up early while it's still dark. Notice he leaves the house, went off to a solitary place, and prayed. Now, he could have prayed in the house. He could have prayed with his friends. But there's something driving him, something that he valued about leaving and going out where he was alone to practice this. Well, we'll keep going. Verse 36, Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found, they went to look for him. We got to find him. Where'd he go? When they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Now, if you're Simon Peter, is that a yay thing or a boo thing? All right, if you're Simon Peter, you love this because this is Mr. Publicist. It's like, okay, finally getting traction. Jesus, finally you're getting the attention you deserve. Come on, everyone's looking for you, Jesus. You gotta get to him. You gotta butter him up a little bit. Give him some attention. Look what Jesus says, verse 38. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So notice it could have been real easy for Jesus just to give in to the attention, stay right there, make that his base. But he had enough of a connection with God the Father that he knew that was not his mission. He had a different path and he was strong enough to say no to what those people wanted there to follow the path he knew God had for him. And probably one of the reasons on the human level that Jesus was able to do this was because he had practiced enough solitude and prayer and connection with God as Father one-on-one -on -one, that he was strong enough on his own in who he was to not give in to the pressures of the people that would pull him off of the path that he knew God had for him. Well, look at, look at Mark 6 on the screen, the next one here. Another story in Jesus' life. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land and we'll stop there. But again, just notice another incident of Jesus deliberately leaving his disciples, going off by himself uh, up on a mountainside. That takes some extra work. He could have just... Stayed on the shore. He could have sat under the nearest tree. But he kind of went, bent over backwards to seek out some solitary place in the wilderness. Look at Luke 5 on the screen. Here Luke tells us in words what we would have already have guessed from looking at these incidents in Jesus' life. Yet the news about Jesus spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Look at verse 16. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So here we see this identified, yes, in fact, as a pattern of Jesus' life. This is something he often did, pray, yes, but particularly went off by himself to pray, sought out some lonely place, some empty place. And that's super interesting because we'd say, who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is divine, okay? But notice as well, we believe that there's one God and three persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit, so Jesus is divine. But notice he is not the Father. He is a separate person from the Father, a distinct person. And God the Son 
God, the human, Jesus, knew that he lived in dependence on God, his Father. And this is the one that he needed to spend time with and draw strength from. And so we see Jesus, the Son of God, leaving other responsibilities and seeking out this solitude to connect with his Father. Look at Luke 6 on the screen. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, because of course, and spent the night praying to God all night long on the mountain. This is also a spiritual discipline. I forget what it's called in the Christian tradition. Maybe keeping watch. That could be it. He spent the night praying to God. When the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them who he designated apostles. Now, is that like a significant moment in Jesus' life? Is that a strategic moment? Yeah, it sure is. And so notice what precedes it, him going off by himself all night long, giving up sleep to be alone. And one of these books said this is one of the ways that some people have found to find solitude is deliberately waking up in the middle of the night for times of prayer when everyone else is asleep and then going back to sleep. Uh, interesting. Look at John 6. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So again, Jesus receives too much attention, too much favorable attention. He's aware that the people want to make him king. By the way, does that sound pretty good? How many of you would like to be king out there? Anybody? That sounds pretty good. Micah wants to be king. Josiah wants to make Micah king. If you're king, life's pretty good. Would you like to be a queen? That sounds great. Look, they're, they're, Jesus, we want you to be the king. That's pretty good. But still, Jesus says, nope, not giving into that, not my plan. He was strong enough to leave that and seek out solitude. Uh, we'll skip this next category, Jesus in solitude with a few others. Uh, look at this one. Jesus unsuccessful in seeking solitude. And look, this is harder to find for many of us than it sounds. Like, if you're a mom with a bunch of kids... Okay, solitude, what is that? They can pick the lock to get into the bathroom when you're in there, right? Um, so, look at this, Mark 6. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Luke says this, comes, this is after the disciples have gone out on a mission trip. All right, they've been out preaching in villages and healing people and stuff, so they come back. And they told him all, all they'd done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So Jesus says, okay, guys, we are going to leave. We're going to go off by ourselves. We're going to rest. So here is a retreat or a break. Verse 32. So they went away by themselves in a boat. Where? To a solitary place. We're going to get out of here. We're going to go off by ourselves is the plan. Well, what happens? You might recall the story. Verse 33, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Now that must have been a, a sinking feeling in the stomach. Like, wait, what? Who is that? Tell me that's not a crowd of people. They're trying to get away and they're waiting for them are the very people they're trying to get away from. Well, 34, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So failed in the attempt to find solitude and rest. But notice they were trying. Jesus was trying there to do it. Uh, skip on down to solitude in the Old Testament. There's a variety of things we could look at, but this one's interesting. So this is from the life of the prophet Elijah, 1 Kings 19. So what's going on here? Elijah's uh, one of God's chosen prophets, and he's just had this showdown, you may recall, on the mountain with the prophets of Baal, and, and they arranged this test, and, and Elijah said, let's make two altars, we each call upon our God, the God that answers with lightning, he's the true God. By the way, Baal was a storm God, so this should have been his thing, but nothing happens when the prophets of Baal call out, and God sends down lightning, consumes the thing, and so Elijah's like, all right, everybody, rise up and kill all the prophets of Baal, and so they all get slaughtered, and like in the ancient way you do things, this is like how it goes. So it's a bloodbath, and the righteous side has come through, it seems, and Elijah's on top of the world, and everything's wonderful. But then the king and queen of Israel, who love Baal and hate Yahweh and hate Elijah, they hear about this. They're like, okay, we need to kill Elijah. And so Elijah hears about this, and he goes from what seems to be like a great victory to now he's utterly depressed and terrified and wants to die. We'll pick up the story in 1 Kings 19. 
look on the screen. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba and the Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So he leaves his buddy, goes off by himself for a whole day into the wilderness, the desert. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Ever been there? <laughs> Look at that. He walks a whole day into the wilderness. Like, you couldn't just do that there? No, I'm going to walk a whole day into the wilderness. Then I'll pray to die. Look what he says. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Here it comes, he's thinking. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Well, that's weird. But again, way out into the wilderness. Must have been some sort of supernatural sustenance if that's all he ate. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He says the same thing again. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. God's like, okay. Time for change. Do this, do this, do this. We're going to mix things up. Okay, so this is not Elijah going out in the wilderness for spiritual growth, right? This is not him wanting to be closer to God and just his heart's full of joy and love, and so he goes out in the wilderness to try to connect with God. I mean, this is him in the depths of despair and wanting to die. And yet notice what a formative experience it is out in the wilderness alone when God's in the mix, and so we see lots of other occasions uh, in the story of Scripture of God's people in the wilderness out and seeking him. One more one from the Old Testament. Look on the screen here. Lamentations. So the book of Lamentations. This is also a downer. Like, this is not a pleasant deal. This is written by the prophet Jeremiah at the destruction of his beloved city, Jerusalem. So he had tried his hardest to get the people to repent and obey the Lord. They did not, and Jerusalem gets destroyed. The city walls get broken through. People get killed and go off into captivity. And so Jeremiah writes this book in sorrow and sadness. Well, here's one of the bright spots in the book. Look at it. Jeremiah says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And we usually stop there, because that's a nice, happy ending. That's great. Stitch it on a pillow. It's beautiful. But he keeps going. Uh, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. And then look at this. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Again, yeah, he's not talking about solitude for spiritual growth, but he is talking about there is an appropriate time of life of struggle and mourning where it is a very healthy and valuable thing to sit alone and in silence and, and seek the Lord. 
And there are seasons in life where this is precisely the best route to becoming what we want to be and what God wants us to be. Well, there's more we could look at, but let's just bounce back up to the heading there, Jesus teaches solitude. Now, Jesus taught the practice of solitude by his example to his disciples, and that's recorded for us. But notice this very explicit teaching as well. Look at Matthew 6. Jesus says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who's unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, this teaching is clearly in the context of, like, against hypocrisy. So his main point is don't be a hypocrite in doing religious things to impress people. He says do it secretly. So it's just between you and God. But notice, inescapably, Jesus commands us to private prayer there. And Jesus practices this in his own life of retreating from everybody to seek the Lord. Okay, so let's look in closing here at part five. Solitude in the teachings of others. Now, we're not going to read all these. Mostly, I've given this uh, to you for you to look at on your own. Just look at a couple of these. Look at this first paragraph. This guy writes this. Solitude frees us. The normal day-to-day human interactions locks us into patterns of feeling, thought, and action that are geared to a world set against God. Nothing but solitude can allow the development of a freedom from the ingrained behaviors that hinder our integration into God's order. So our lives are so pressured, so busy, so squeezed by everything. He's suggesting to us one of the ways of freedom is deliberate solitude. And notice this is not just being by yourself so you can worry about your problems. It's not just being by yourself so you can keep thinking about all the things you do. But this is seeking out solitude to try to shed as much as we can uh, these pressures from other people, all the worries that come down on us, and try to just isolate kind of who we are as ourselves in the presence of God. So it's a way to try to step back from all the things that usually fill our mind, or at least bring those things perhaps to God in solitude. Drop down to the dangers of solitude. Look at that first paragraph. In solitude, we confront our own soul with its obscure forces and conflicts that escape our attention when we're interacting with others. Thus, he quotes someone, solitude is a terrible trial, for it serves to crack open and burst apart the shell of our superficial securities. It opens us out. It opens out to us the unknown abyss that we all carry within us and discloses the fact that these abysses are haunted. When we're so busy with people, we're so busy with the next thing, and all we do is play music like me, one song after another. If something's worth doing, it's worth doing, listening to music. We can just bury all the hard things. We can just avoid asking ourselves the difficult questions about ourselves. We can try to avoid dealing with our dysfunctions and our brokenness. We can try to just ignore the hurts that really do haunt us, but we just keep it covered over. The idea of solitude is, as much as possible, we strip these things away from us, and we come into the presence of God as we really are, unhidden by all of these things that so often fill our surfaces. He goes on, we can only survive solitude if we cling to Christ there. And yet what we find of him in that solitude enables us to return to society as free persons. Okay, but what if you're an introvert and you love being alone? Like, you might think of all this and be like, what? This clearly was all written by extroverts because I love solitude. I love to be alone. Okay, true enough. But remember, we're not talking about solitude just for solitude's sake or by itself. This is solitude as a spiritual discipline. So this is solitude pursued for spiritual reasons. So this is solitude deliberately focused on drawing near to God. So it's different than just being alone naturally. Look at what this next guy says. This is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German Lutheran pastor who was executed for trying to kill Hitler. That's pretty cool. Look what he wrote. Let him who cannot be alone be aware of community. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. 
each by itself has profound pitfalls and perils. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings. And one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. So it may be that some of you are naturally programmed to solitude and life alone with God. And your danger and your concern is not pursuing more solitude. Your concern should be, okay, how do I engage with other people in the pursuit of Christ? So these must be balanced with each other as well, though we're focusing on solitude. Okay, what about some practical tips? How, how do we build this into our lives? Here's some suggestions. You can look at them later. One suggestion is to try to leverage little solitary moments that you can carve out of your day. I mean, you're probably super busy. Maybe you're too busy to, uh, it seems, to pursue deliberate solitude. Well, what are little moments that at least you could leverage and uh, fill with this meaning? A few minutes in the morning when you drink your coffee. Someone after first service said a common thread he's noticed in the lives of many very godly Christians is the moment they wake up, they have trained themselves. The moment they wake in the morning, their first thought is a prayer or a speech to God or a submission to him. And there's a moment of solitude at the beginning of the day that would mark our experience significantly. Uh, this guy goes on to say, what about if you're building a house? Why not build a special room in your house? That this is a room for solitude. This is a, pl- a retreat center in your house. One of these books I read about Susanna Wesley a couple hundred years ago, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, godly woman growing up. So she had like 12 kids or something. So not much solitude, right? So apparently, do you know what she used to do? Someone knew this in first service. A couple people know this. She would take her, three of you know this, well done. She would take her apron and she'd lift it up over her head and she'd read her Bible and pray under there. Okay, it doesn't block much noise, but at least it sent a signal to the kids, leave mom alone, you know? Uh, So look at this. So Chris and Sean Wright are some people that are part of our church, and they actually uh, pursued this as a value. And so look what they built on their property. So here is an actual prayer chapel. They built this at their first house or their prior house where they lived at. They came and moved into town and built another house, and they moved it here. So here's their own prayer chapel, retreat center. Uh, Friday, I was with some of my kids at a friend's farm, getting ready for hunting, checking like deer stands and stuff, and, and he showed us, here's one particular hill where he has a big cross built overlooking one of his lakes. He says, this is where I come to pray. This is my spot. He says, I've had many shouted conversations to God here. And then he actually said to us, he's like, why don't you guys go ahead and check that deer stand over there, go through the, check that cornfield. I'm just going to linger here a few minutes and pray for a while. So here's a value in this guy's life that he had marked this as a place of significance spiritually, a retreat to him to go to. So think about that. Yes, leverage little moments, but why not try to establish some special places? And look, we have some significant advantages here in northern Minnesota compared to somebody, say, living in downtown Manhattan. Where did Jesus typically go for solitude? Out in the wilderness. Well, that might have some merit, right? And part of the year, at least, we could do that. All of the year, we could do that if we wear the right clothes. So... Look here at our training plan, I've called it. What I want you to do is to experiment with this this week. I would like you to try to engage in some deliberate time of solitude beyond whatever you might normally do. And again, not not only do we mean just being alone and doing something else, but actually seeking out solitude with a focus on God for spiritual reasons. And I've given you four different levels of commitment with this, depending on how much you want to put into this, how much time you want to spend. Uh, If you flip over to page five, later in this handout, I've given you the entire entry on solitude from this other book, um, Handbook of Spiritual Disciplines, for you to read more about solitude. And she has suggested four spiritual exercises down at the bottom. And so the four different levels that I'm challenging you to to pick one is going to be simply uh, using one of these or two of these or three of these or all four of these spiritual exercises. And notice the fourth one is a full half-day retreat where you carve out your schedule half a day to go and pursue solitude. And um, so I want you to look that over and, and think about, okay, which one of these do you wish to pursue this week? 
And solitude in ways, well, you'll have more to do later on as we add more spiritual disciplines to this. That's one hesitancy I had about doing this first. Because to a great degree, right, solitude is, she said, a container discipline. So while you're in solitude, yes, as solitude, but also here we meditate on Scripture. Here we pray. Here we, do, 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 and we haven't covered all of those things. So you may not know what to do to fill your time, unless you've been a believer a long time, you've done some of these other things. If you don't know what to do, just go and be alone with God. Watch your thoughts. Watch where they go. Where do you immediately start thinking about? Bring them back to God. It goes over here. Okay, bring it back. No, I'm here talking to God. I'm thinking about God. You can read the Bible. You can pray. And it'll be interesting to see how that goes. So we're going to sing a song. Why don't you guys stand up? Think these over. Uh, Look it over today. And uh, notice as well, I'm challenging you to think about finding one other person or a group of people to discuss your experience with. And I've given you a discussion guide uh, along those lines as well. Today we zeroed in on the, the first of these spiritual disciplines we will focus on and experiment with this fall and solitude. We started out by looking at this proverb in a call to discipline where it says, like a city whose walls are broken down is a person without discipline, without self-control. And so if we are lacking this fruit of the Spirit, if we are lacking this work of God in our lives, we're going to be vulnerable to all sorts of things. Well, how do we get more (laughs) self-control? Well, ultimately we can't just conjure it up and say, well, today I'm going to be more self-controlled exactly. But what we can do is do what we can and say, Lord, bring this out in me. Help me to place myself where you can develop this more in me. And as we engage in practices like solitude, this will be a rolling, reinforcing cycle that will be better at self-control, and the self-control will help us be better at the disciplines, and we'll, by God's mercy, grow and accomplish uh, those things he has for us. So don't forget those training plan options. I want you to engage with solitude uh, this week. Specific, deliberate solitude, beyond whatever might be normal for you, for the purpose of uh, drawing near to God. Let's remind ourselves of this guy, Jocko, all month long, up early, showing us that's his goals, health, focus, strength, working out every day, getting up before everybody else, intensity, and he's living it. So what do you know? Not long after I got up this morning, a new tweet came on. Here he is this morning. What time was Jocko up this morning? Look at that. 4.33 this morning, hitting his workout. Now, Josiah noticed his, day, his watch is like a day ahead, so I don't know what's going on with that. But what we want to do is try to capture some part, I think, of this intensity that he shows towards his goals and apply this to our goals, namely the spiritual life, knowing Jesus and growing in him. So, go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, repay no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, Help the afflicted, honor everyone, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.